This is C-SPAN's America and the Courts. On Friday morning, the Florida Supreme Court heard oral argument in Tallahassee on whether Reform Party presidential candidate Ralph Nader's name may be included on the Florida presidential ballot this year. The Florida Democratic Party sued to keep Mr. Nader's name off the ballot, claiming the Reform Party is not a legitimate political party. Florida Secretary of State Glenda Hood ordered that Mr. Nader's name appear on the ballot. A lower Florida court ruled that his name be removed. The state Supreme Court heard expedited arguments because absentee ballots for Florida voters overseas are to be mailed out Saturday, September 18. Later on Friday, the court determined that Mr. Nader's name will appear on Florida's presidential ballot. Here is Friday's oral argument. Supreme Court of the great state of Florida is now in session. All who have cause to plead, draw near, give attention, and you shall be heard. God save these United States, the great state of Florida, and this honorable court. Ladies and gentlemen, the Florida Supreme Court. Please be seated. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Florida Supreme Court. Uh, the first case and only case on today's docket is the Reform Party of Florida versus Harriet Black and Glenda Hood versus the Reform Party. Before uh, beginning, I just wanted to uh, mention a few preliminary matters. As you'll see, Justice Contero is not with us today. However, through the uh, wonders of modern technology, he is watching this oral argument. He is in Miami. He was called there on Wednesday. His father is in critical condition in the uh, hospital, and uh, so our thoughts are with you, Justice Contero, and, but he will be participating in the uh, deliberations in this case. Also, I know there was an outstanding motion for, from the Reform Party for an amended brief to be filed. Uh, the court uh, denies that, so any matters that any case law that might be cited in the amended portion should not be referred to in oral argument. Third, the court recognizes that the time parameters in this case, both for the briefing and uh, for the court's del deliberative uh, function is uh, very compressed, and we are mindful of the fact that uh, the September 18th deadline is looming tomorrow. So uh, and we appreciate council having uh, complied as best as they could with these uh, extraordinary deadlines. In the uh, time today, I know the justices will have uh, many questions, but we ask that all parties focus on the definition of national party within the statute. Uh, so with that, uh, the party's ready, and I'd call uh, the Reform Party, Ken Sakaya. Thank you. May it please the court, uh, Madam Chief Justice and members of the uh, court. I am Ken Sakaya, and I represent Ralph Nader and Peter Cameo in this case. As I uh, looked at the uh, circumstances, uh, the facts, and also the law that was uh, confronting us, I believe that the court's decision uh, must be governed uh, in any review in this case by certain uh, key principles. And one of those is that which both the Supreme Court of the United States and this court has recognized. And that is that the rights at stake here, that is the right of uh, assembly, free assembly, free expression, and to vote, are not just fundamental rights, but they are the most precious of all fundamental rights because as the Supreme Court said in Rhodes and again in Celebrez, because they are preservative of all other rights. But you agree that the state unquestionably has the right to impose reasonable restrictions on the right of access, and that's been uh, reiterated in numerous cases. So we have that as a beginning, and yet what we have is a term, national party, that's been in the statute since 1970, 
but was uh, freed from the percentage requirement in 1999. So, again, with that in mind, uh, is this, yes. do you take a position on how uh, the court should construe national party? Yes. Uh, Your Honor, as this court said, when it comes to construing a statute of this nature, uh, nearly four years ago in Harris v. Palm Beach, uh, that uh, uh, when the court said that the right of suffrage is the preeminent right recognized in Florida's Declaration of Rights. And therefore, election laws, and this is in, in answer to your question, election laws, as the court put it, must receive a liberal construction well, let me ask in you favor, would you well, in, well. in favor of the voters whose rights they tend to restrict. Basically, let's go back to the very basic. Is what is a national party? Is that a question of law or is that a question of fact? I believe it must be a question of law. It must be a question of law because persons like my clients must have some certainty so that they may know before they go into uh, making assessments as to whether they shall proceed under Section how, how 4A. How could it be an exclusive question of law? if there must be some factual determination as to whether a party, for instance, is a local or state party, which only with only a local or state focus, for instance, or whether or not it is truly a national party. Well, in, in other words, doesn't there have to be some factual determination it, as to the, the expanse or the interest of the particular entity. Your Honor, I, I believe that when, when you're looking at uh, what, the, what the legislature did when they set this, uh, this statute out, that they were not intending that there be uh, a factual analysis which goes behind the certification which is presented by, uh, to the Secretary and, well, while, and which... While you're on legislative intent, and I think that is critical to, uh, to what is before us this morning, would you, you have focused on and studied this issue probably much more thoroughly than we have here on the bench. And could you, you give us your view of what you believe it was the intent of the legislature really to offer this sort of alternative means uh, for candidates to get on the state ballot? And that is alternative to the petition process that required a certain percentage of registered voters uh, to be certified. What would you take it to be the intent of the legislature now in offering this alternative means? Yes, sir. Well, I, I believe you have to go back to the, uh, the Article 11 of the Constitution, which was enacted or which was uh, put into effect in 1998. And uh, when uh, that uh, provision uh, came into effect, it was, it was acknowledged that Florida was the most restrictive state in the country. In but ballot. wasn't that provision already in the statute at the time that that uh, amendment was passed? I mean, although it was coupled with, uh, wasn't it at that prior to that, wasn't it coupled with the petition? You had to have both the petition and the association with a national party that has a national convention. So you already had that in the statute. So why was that a part of the well, statute? I, what was I, the well, legislature's intent? Let me go to the second, second part of my response then, and that is if you look at the subsection, if you look at that same subsection A, and you look at the last sentence in the subsection, it, it doesn't leave any, uh, any uh, real, it's not merely uh, discretionary, it's in fact mandatory. It says that once the uh, certification is made, but which is a ma certification made under penalty of perjury and, and, and is a criminal offense, if false, once it is certified by the uh, minor party that they are affiliated with the national party which nominated at, at, at their national convention their candidate, the secretary shall I understand order. That, that that's the secretary's duty, but does it then follow that no one can look behind whether or not those particular certifications are in fact true. Uh, we believe it does. We believe Counsel, that's what, what it means. What, uh, if that's the case, yes. then it would appear to me that, that any number of local or individuals uh, could simply file a certificate, uh, not concerned with these penalties of perjury, but, but to pervert the process. And, and are you suggesting that 
that no one can look behind a certification if it is a patently false? Well, if, if ever, if, if, uh, if that were the problem that, that, it has, that has been suggestion, suggested by the plaintiffs, i.e. that this could create or result in a, uh, an unmanageable ballot, which is one of the, under the strict scrutiny uh, test, is one of the limited bases on which the court may even uh, uh, look to uh, the, uh, uh, any kind of restrictions. If that were the case, why then, I believe the court may ask, hasn't that happened already? Because there has been no ruling whatsoever during all the years that this provision has been in place as to what that means. There hasn't been that situation. Well, you're suggesting that because before someone, theoretically, has not violated the election laws, that uh, therefore it follows that no one can ever challenge if one believes a violation has occurred. Well, I'm not saying... I'm that. not following that logic. Well, I, I'm, I, I thought you were, you were suggesting or indicating that someone who gets involved in the process of, of, uh, of seeking to place candidates on the ballot could uh, treat, uh, if they knew that there would be no, uh, no examination of their assertions, uh, subsequently, that they could treat this as an opportunity to uh, simply falsify their certification. Let, let's suppose, for instance, that the Secretary of State uh, reads in the headlines of the newspapers one day that Re Reform Party of USA disbands, uh, and uh, it's the headlines in the New York Times, and there's a detailed story, and then with quotes of documents filed uh, with the Federal Elections uh, Commission, and uh, just indicating that there no longer is a, uh, a reform party. And then two weeks later, the Secretary of State receives these filings like this. And uh, she calls up to the Federal Elections Commission and says, you know, I read this story in the New York Times. Is it true? And uh, whoever is the head of that says, absolutely. You, you want me to fax you copies? And they fax her copies. And as a result of that, she denies uh, placing uh, this on the ballot. And now you're put in the posture, you bring a, a law action against the Secretary of State. Are you saying the Secretary of State could not then defend that action and say, well, you know, we received uh, proof that this party had disbanded? I believe we believe the legislature intended that only legitimate, functioning national parties uh, were covered by this provision. What would be the outcome in a situation? Yes, I, well, I believe that at, 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 that, at that point, I, I, and, and uh, that the Secretary uh, would have an, a degree of discretion because that's the Secretary's job well, to What's the to difference determine. between that situation and well, the factual that, situation faced by the trial court in uh, this year? Well, let me suggest, let me assume that, that uh, getting past that, that uh, question and assume that there is, is that discretion or that there is some discretion to go beyond. I'm, I, I'm just simply presenting that as our initial point, which we presented in our brief, which we, we don't believe it's appropriate for the courts to go beyond this because the circumstances of this case indicate why that's a problem. Well, you're calling it discretion, okay, and what uh, I'm well, suggesting is that if, as in the petition process, all right, there has to be some validation, of course, of the number of signatures, and of course, we're more comfortable with that, because that's sort of a mathematical but, uh, but if I might, thing. If I but what's might. the difference between that and checking that and checking the authenticity, indeed, of whether or not a party is still it, it, a legitimate And that's what I'm party. suggesting. It, it is the Secretary's uh, legitimate function and, and, and responsibility if they, if they wanted to uh, check the uh, authentication of this. And, of course, the, if that was all in the papers, then the authentication would come into some question. All right, let but, me, Mr. I just but, want to remind you, I know you're dividing your time. I know. I, know I, I, would like to, I would like to get to some, assume for the sake of argument that, that you can get past this. What are the facts in this case, and why would it make any difference in this case? And I believe it wouldn't make any difference, because if ever there was a national party, there is a national party in this case. So just well, to, because you were, we're now, I don't know if, you, if Mr. Marrow's minds that you're taking his time, because you're in it now with the okay. red light on, yeah. is that? He seems to be indicating, because that, that is important for you to address that for us, and that is, where did the trial court go wrong here in terms of considering the evidence then 
as to whether or not uh, this is a viable national party. Well, I believe, you know, in, in August and September of 2004. That's right. He, he uh, assessed Did he it. go wrong? He went wrong because he relied upon an unrecognized, uh, 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 non-workable standard that was presented by one expert when two other experts said this is not the widely accepted standard. Well, what standard, standard would you have us apply? I guess that's going back to the question I hope we're going to get I believe you this. must apply the broadest standard. And what standard is that? And that is a standard that is, well, first let me say, it's the broadest standard that this court can impose but consistent with due process, standard? and it would uh, be, what, what in, it, in, my est in my estimation. Tell us what the standard is. It would be that you must look to what, what the definition in the statute under 97 uh, uh, 21, uh, 14 is. How, how does that define national it party? Defines, it defines political party. It people. defines political party. And I believe you have to start with that, which is a group of persons associated uh, for the purpose of electing candidates. And then in order to take it into the national realm, I believe if this court were required to set forth a, uh, a, a, a limitation on that, that it should be the broadest. And that would be that it would be in two different states or two or more states and not in the same region. Well, where would you look for a definition of, of national? Uh, if we look to uh, Black's Law Dictionary, for example, I'm sure you've, you've looked at that. Have you not? I have not, not in, not in this case. I, because I would suggest to you that, that, that some of the, the uh, definitions would indicate nationwide. Well, this would not is indicate two states, would not indicate one state, would not indicate regional would indicate nationwide pertaining to the entire country. Okay, well then. Does that, be, is that help me understand? For several, be for several reasons, that cannot be the test. Because there is no party, uh, there is no minor party in the, in the country that is, uh, that is consistently uh, active in, in elections in every state. In fact, we are only one of five minor parties in the country that is operating uh, with candidates on more than five ballots. So you're saying the there nation. has to be a difference between a, uh, what is a major political party, which might be the Republican and the Democrat, yes. and a national party. But yes. your definition then is really still for somebody looking for next time, if we take what comes out of this case, really anybody could say that they've got an organization in two states and they can get on the ballot in Florida by certifying. That would be, okay. that's what would come out of this, is well, that correct? Anyone I can, just, I'm not, I just want to understand the rule of law that we would be announcing that. They, they, if they did not have such, a, uh, such an uh, organization in two different states in which they were seeking to, uh, seeking to uh, elect candidates, then they would be lying when they made that oath. Uh, is there and a problem in, in this case? You represent both Nader and the Reform Party. Or no, there, I do not. You don't. You no, represent. Rep that's, that's exactly right. You represent the Reform Party. No, I represent Nader okay. and, and Mr. Cameo. Okay, all right. Thank yeah, you. Okay, may, I, may I step down and. and yes. Thank, thank you. Mr. Now, we've, is this. We're, you're going to be arguing for the Secretary of State? May it please the Court, Your Honors, George Maris on behalf of the uh, Secretary of State of Florida. Let Mr. Me go Maris, let me, let me ask you this. Yes. What, what does the record reflect as to how the Secretary has administered the statute? The record reflects that the, the uh, Secretary has assumed and interpreted the statute as a ministerial role to determine whether under 103.021, there is a certification to the Secretary of State, and when that occurs, they are paid. Has the Secretary denied access to the ballot to any uh, person that uh, claimed to be a minor political party under, one of, under, under Section A? There's, there's nothing in the record about that, Your Honor, and I don't know the answer to that otherwise. Am I, I correct that this statute was amended again in 90, 1999. Before that, it had the same terms, but it had this additional requirement that you had to have a percentage of votes. Is that correct? It, it did not have the alternative. Of it didn't the have the alternative. Convention. It needed. Well, it had. It's, it, it said a, a, a national. Let's see. Let me make sure I've got exactly what it says here. So it's, before that, it said that uh, minority political parties which are affiliated with the national party holding a national convention, but they had to get a certain percentage of the vote. Yes. So they had that whole term there. Now they severed that term 
from the percentage. Right. So now minor political parties have two ways to get on. They can get on either. No, is that not true? No, uh, let, let me clarify that. But, Your Honors, if I can, let me tell you from the perspective of Secretary of State what a workable standard might be. Of, the of what a national? Of what a national okay. party is, if I may. And that is to first start with Section 97, uh, point, uh, the, the definition of local party in, nine, in Chapter 97. I mean minor party. With regard to minor party. And then a common sense but broad definition of national party. And that would be, and let me just, let me tell you the... Uh, well, what is the definition of minor party is, okay. is and, someone and less than 5%, right? It's the 5% number. A national, well, it's... it's it goes beyond that, but a national party would be any, any group of citizens organized for the general purposes of electing persons and determining public issues under democratic processes, and then going on. That is from 97. With membership or organizations in two or more states and extending beyond a single region of the country. Now, what I just read the last part is not in Chapter 97, but it takes minor party and then attributes a national perspective to it. Is it minor party or political? Is there two different definitions, one for minor party and one for political party? Uh, there is a def there's a definition. It's 97.021 paren 15 is minor political party. And is that defined with reference to whether they have a platform? This, no, th th what this says, first of all, it's minor if it's less than 5% of the population. Okay, so then... And then the it's a political party if it is any group of persons organized for the general purposes of electing to office qualified persons and determining public issues under the democratic processes of the United Has States. Has the Secretary of State been using that standard? Secretary of State has not been making factual determinations as to whether the submissions fit this standard. When you're a, saying the sec it would be appropriate for the Secretary of State uh, to do that now under the definition that you're offering, if and to the, reject those that don't meet the definition that you're offering. If the court, Your Honor, creates a definition of national party, someone, some entity, whether it's the Secretary of State or the Attorney General or others, would have some ability well, would you come back to my question about legislative intent? Because it seems to me, obviously, that this is what we need, you know, to focus on here. And, uh, of, of course, we have many questions, and you all have been very helpful in, in responding, but uh, it's difficult to, to sort of get an answer to that, that question. It seems to me that the, the case law, all the way from the U.S. Supreme Court to the federal circuits and some of the state case law, has said that the purpose of these restrictions is to be sure that we're not talking about a frivolous entity, okay, that, that really doesn't have any support and is really just a distraction, you know, or a dilution of the process as opposed to a legitimate part of the process. Hence the traditional requirement of the petition where you show that, that you've been active enough that you can already get a certain percentage of registered voters, all right. And that this alternative provision then uh, has the same focus or requirement. However, it substitutes the fact that if a national party has sponsored you, then we will accept that as an alternative way, you know, to show legitimacy. Right. Would you agree with that? To some extent. You know, well, well, no, help, well, help let me, me. Let me explain would, why. Would you First pick of all, up on that then right. and tell me because... I, I, I think that's part of the concern that we have here as far as whether or not, uh, as opposed to the petition process, that there has been this showing that, yes, I have legitimacy or we have legitimacy because a national party with a national convention and a national platform has put me on the ballot and I'm carrying their banner and therefore you can be sure that I have that legitimacy. I said I disagree, Your Honor, because there's been a, a discussion of alternative means, and, and I will later explain why there are not alternative means in the context that the court said. I just but wanted let to me talk remind about you of, about the later, you're, it's, and this is tough. You're I, now I in their rebuttal, it, and we're going to... you want me to wait for rebuttal, well, Your no, Honor, I will? I want you to, if you want to okay. finish, but there's not going to be a lot later. Yes. Um, the question of intent, let me walk you through the intent. 
1997, this court and the, and, and the law and the policy of the state of Florida was that there is a legitimate state interest in promoting the national parties and minimizing, to some extent, smaller parties so as not to fractionalize the vote. In 1998, the people of Florida passed Article 6, Section 1, which was new and said that elections and political parties and candidates are subject to regulation, but, and I quote, the requirements for a candidate with no party affiliation or for a candidate of a minor party for placement of the candidate's name on the ballot shall be no greater than the requirements for a candidate of the party having the largest number of registered voters. In response to that, approximately six months later, in 1999, the legislature passed this provision, which provided for no, uh, uh, re no percentage requirement. But Mr. Maros, I think the question here really comes down to, would you agree that in the section of the statute that requires you to get out and get uh, the certain percentage of signatures in order to get on the ballot, that that is a re that it's reasonable but substantial. It's a substantial requirement to go out and get these signatures. Yes. And so the question becomes, th doesn't that invent a legislative intent that even in the these other way you can do that, that it's a substantial requirement and it requires something beyond just merely certification that this happened, that you really need to be, to fit this criteria of being a minor party of, affiliated with a national party that has a national convention. That those are substantial requirements that should be and we should consider them equal to the substantial requirement of going out and getting signatures. The, the court has the ability to determine and ascertain compliance with these provisions, no question. But let me, that these are not alternatives, and that's very important to understand. Uh, when you say they're not alternatives, you mean a, a minor party cannot do one or the other? No, ma'am. Let, let, let me explain. Paren A says a minor party that is affiliated with a national party may do it by holding a convention. Paren B says a minor party that is not affiliated with a national party may do it by the percentage. Th these are not alternatives. And what you have... So a minor know, party that is affiliated with a... A, a national, a national party, party... May do it by national convention could not do it by a petition. Correct. Now, and and So going back to that, though, would so wouldn't there have to be then some meaning to the part that is the national party holding a national convention? And, and you've asked us, you said we could create a definition. Right. Problem is the court can't create a definition. We have also have the U.S. Constitution to be concerned right. with and what the what the state legislature determined to be the requirements for the election of the electors. There is nothing, is there, that you uncovered in the legislative history beyond the fact that this constitutional amendment passed that tells us what the legislature intended the, the definition of national party holding a national convention to be. That's correct, Your Honor. Now it's vague, so therefore, is it vague? It, to the extent that th the lower court order would be the law of this court, it would be vague. And, and it, it would, in my opinion, violate the Constitution. It has to be a standard that is sufficiently broad that people can apply these standard ex ante. But how do we, we know? Do You're saying we should apply something that says in one other state. I mean, Hawaii has that. Iowa has. It has to be in 25 states. I mean, so how do we know what the? How do we know what the legislature intended in this regard? If you if you look at the constitutional provision and the new constitutional provision in 1998 and what they did in 1999, I believe the, the, this court can say that the legislature intentionally left this without sp specific standards and in fact what they did was they ex they did not provide rulemaking authority so to the if, department of state if we are talking about this this statute really is talking about for national elections correct 
And so why wouldn't it be reasonable uh, for us to then look to any uh, national legislation or regulations, such as the FEC regu uh, regulations, to determine this issue? Two fundamentally different inquiries. Yeah. Here, the, the inquiry is, when can one be deprived a place on the ballot? And what are the interests of the state in depriving one uh, to be on the ballot? And in particular, with regard to the principles that this court has already said, and that is you err on the side of inclusion. Mr. Morris, I want to, and we have been definitely taking your time, but with our help, you now only have, there's five minutes for rebuttal, so. I, I will answer this question and sit down. I, I apologize. The second, with regard to the F FEC, the policies and interests there are to prevent fraud or corruption with regard to campaign contributions and to make sure that the public, the public monies are properly spent um, and, and only efficiently spent. Those are very, the fundamentally different analysis. And as Justice Periente said, here on the other side of a definition, any definition this court deems under the statute comes up against the rights of association and the rights of, of, of speech of political parties and candidates. And the reason why this not being an alternative is so critical, Your Honors, is that a, a person or a party, absent any standard gra uh, greater or with a standard any more specific and narrow than this, cannot tell what to do. If the Reform Party believes it's affiliated, and remember, this is application of law ex ante, you have to do it first and then be adjudicated. If you look at this and have Judge Davies' standard or anything more specific than this, what do you say? Am I affiliated or am I not? Is this a national party or is it not? Well, Mr. how Mayor does this would address the check? Wait, 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 wait. Let, let me, I know we're, yeah, we're going to give you, I'm, and I, Justice Lewis has a question. I want, uh, uh, rather than save it for rebuttal, we'll give you a few more minutes. If you have suggested a, a vagueness problem. I've not seen the parties provide us with authority, case authority that we can put our hands on, that the statute is vague. It's an invalid statute. You cannot qualify under this statute because this is an invalid statute. Where does that leave us? What, where do we go? Do you have a case that you can direct us to, the authority I, for that? I believe the reform parties, or the, the Nader, either one of the, the reform or Nader parties brief has case citations about void for vagueness. Uh, and there What's are, the result? 34. What's um, the result? Well, the result would only be, and uh, with regard to the Secretary of State, right. is it would only be void for Vegas in application um, if, in fact, this court were to say Judge Davies' method and manner of determining this Again, is what's the, the way. result? What's the result? The result would be that the, that the act would remain, but the Judge Davies' order would be reversed because it is not void for vagueness if, in fact, the duty of the Secretary of State is if there's a certification and if it is provided to the Department of State, the person is placed on the ballot. Now that is very broad, no question about it. But it's not, it's not vague at that point, it is broad. And if there's a problem with that, and if that is too broad, the legislature can, can act. It is the, the sort of ad hoc determination method that Judge Davey uses that is impossible of predictable, rational, application in the future. And the Secretary of State has an abiding interest in not having a situation where parties can't, can't tell in the beginning. If you have a common sense provision about national being in more than one region, and if you have a common sense notion that it's per people who believe that they are affiliated, believe that they are organizing, and that they are, are here, there for political purposes, then you have a reasonable ability to implement that in a way so that people don't make a pick under these three provisions and the pick be wrong. Well, so you're, but, but in the end, the, if the constitutional provision was to allow minor parties affiliated with a, a national party to be on equal par with a major political party, in, 
this interpretation, which is you just have to certify, they're, they're, they're more than equal because the requirements for the primary that you have for the major parties are certainly more onerous than, than just the certificate way. Correct, but Your Honor, I think you have to, I, I think you have to say that the legislature's passage of this act after the constitutional amendment passage is a pretty clear indication that they left these vague for reasons. And in other portions of the statute relating to, to national political parties, there's rulemaking authority for good reason, because they're saying agency, create rules. Here there is a, there's a very loud silence with regard to rulemaking authority because of the constitutional parameters and because of the difficulty of making it specific. But if you would agree that if there was some clear violation, such as that they were not affiliated, that that would be something that the a violation of that part of the statute could be brought in a court of law and remedied through the process that Judge Davey uh, did, you know, through the injunctive process. At some point and in some way, certainly not in, in the manner in which he determined affili affiliation. Affiliation, we would suggest, as, as a standard, if in fact the court is going to do that, is to connect or associate oneself with a party. And, and the oneself is, is reflexive and very important. And well, he decided the affiliation issue in your favor, did he? Correct. I say in your favor. Uh, right. I, I'm just, I'm trying to tell, what I'm telling the court is, is the Secretary of State is, needs a standard that is predictable, that doesn't, that, that, that doesn't disturb settled expectations that have occurred over the years, and that, and that can, pr Protect constitutional but you're telling us that the policy of the Secretary of State to this point has been not to apply the definition that you've suggested for us, but has been merely to accept a certification uh, regardless of the name of the group or, or whatever. Is that correct? That's right. We have, we not, have not implemented the statute which tells us that we shall place on the ballot upon certification. All right, we're going to, I think we better, we are probably, I apologize for the, got expired. Okay, we're going to give you a little additional time for rebuttal, but uh, your, your 30 minutes has expired. Thank you. With our help. Okay. All right. Mr. Tribe. Chief Justice Peretti, and may it please the court, uh, I'm Lawrence Tribe, and I'm counsel for the <clears throat> Wilson appellees, and with me at counsel table is Stephen Rosenthal, Rosenthal and, and also virtually at counsel table, backbenching it is Joel Perwin. Uh, I think I would like to begin well, let, with let me, the let problem me, that you've been struggling with. Let me steer you uh, to, to this last point that uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Maros made, and, and that is that uh, from what I read in this record, that uh, during this election cycle, since the September 1st deadline, that the secretary has certified, uh, what, five or six? Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, five others. Five other minor, minor parties. parties. So there's six total. And, uh, the, and so the, the application of this statute during this election cycle has been, as the secretary says, and that is to, if someone certifies they're in a minor party, then the state's going to allow them on the ballot. And well, is that correct? Well, Your Honor, certainly the testimony has been that it is ministerial and automatic. Uh, but the fact that these five have been approved would not in itself prove that. It might be, and I think it is the case, that with each of them, uh, there is a very solid record showing that they meet the requirements of the statute. It is a strange interpretation, it seems to me, of the statute, but it is the secretary's interpretation. Well, is but she doesn't ask the question, is there any truth at all to the claims? The Justice Hans said example, uh, if a party see, disappears. I mm -hmm. didn't see in the record 
uh, any indication that in the 2000 election cycle that the secretary had uh, administered this statute any differently. No indication either way, Your Honor. No indication. But right. and I think I so there was nothing in the in the method and the policy that the state had had out there up through September 1st that would indicate other than filing the, a certificate, and if you were a minor party, that you wouldn't get on the ballot. Is that not well? That's right. Except, Your Honor, if I were to form suddenly a well, suppose I were to form a group like the American Heritage Foundation, but much smaller, it would advocate positions. It would advocate sometimes the election of people. It would meet the definition that they would have of a political party. But I think those groups would not think to apply because it would be their assumption that words mean something. Uh, it is not, it seems to me, uh, the case that we have so degenerated as a society that we have to assume uh, that there isn't some degree of self-imposed enforcement. But hasn't the legislature really left us out on a limb here? That is, that uh, they've used words like national party and national mm -hmm. convention, and they really have provided uh, no explicit guidance with reference to this. And then when we go and we see for instance, in this record, that even the federal agency charged with uh, regulating uh, elections and conduct during elections uh, has really a, a very broad uh, a base of, of definitions here of, of legitimacy to, uh, to national parties. Uh, aren't we left in, in sort of a, uh, a, a political maze uh, that perhaps the courts uh, should not tread into? in this situation where the legislature has not given us more guidance and we have a constitutional background where uh, we, 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 we want really uh, to give a deference to participation in elections, I both by candidates and, and voters. So help me with a legislature that is that has used this language. And not specifically uh, and defined not specifically, it. specifically, uh, how, how can we now impose on the election official in the state uh, an obligation uh, more narrow after the fact. That is that, and this is part of the difficulty, you know, with the case law traditionally on issues like this, right. is that you can't Let me come try up, to answer your, you your know, question. afterwards uh, with, with, with answers, you know, that... Right. The, the, the well, first, first, first of all, Justice Anstead, I think we should remember when you say after the fact that it's in a sense before the fact. That is, this kind of issue will come up, hopefully, if people do not wait quite as long as Mr. Nader and the Reform Party did to trigger it. It will come up before the election. It's not a criminal prosecution for someone not having guessed right what national party would mean. And the law is very clear that the standards of vagueness are very much more generous to the legislature, as I would urge you to be, when the legislature is not throwing people in jail for violating something written in invisible ink. Okay, before we get any further, uh, does, do you offer for us, if we were to write our opinion, and we said the legislature used the term national party holding a national convention, mm -hmm. uh, we construe that term to mean what? What would be the, right, what right. would you well, fill in the blank? I, I think there are two approaches that you might take. I mean, one of them, looks more legislative, and you might be a little nervous about it, understandably, and that is codifying it, saying by national party, national means not local, not statewide, not regional, but having a significant presence throughout the nation. Significant means more than 12 and a half percent. You know, if you were to do that, and I don't have a number to suggest, we couldn't do that, could we? It seems to me it would be very difficult not for only, you to not make only, it explicit in those terms. We you couldn't could. do it because, again, as you point out, not only do we have the constitutional uh, rights at stake of but the article, candidate, article but two. we have the Article 2 that requires and puts plenary power in the legislature. So in this area, we would be to, to go and make up a definition well, would be to... With all respect, with all respect, I, I think Article 2 has become quite a boogeyman. 
Well, I don't, and it I mean, may it have been in the, the last election, but in this one, it seems to go directly to well, the but, fact that the legislature. But could, it chose couldn't the legis to use this let me ask word. You, couldn't the legislature come up with no restrictions? Could they say in this state, we're not going to put any restrictions on who can go on our ballot? Could they do it, that? It could, but it would produce chaotic and ballots. Maybe it, it Worse gets, than butterfly, centipede ballots. It could get chaotic, and then maybe a state a voter could say that now I, my right to vote effectively is diluted to nothing. Diluted. It's, it's possible. The right to vote would become close Perhaps. to meaningless if you had a, a tele, Manhattan telephone directory. But in this oh, case, that. the Democratic Party and the individual plaintiffs are not asserting any violation of any of their constitutional rights if the statute is construed in the broadest sense to allow access by the Reform Party and its candidates. To anyone. No, we're simply saying that we have standing because we, know you have we are standing. entitled to have a legal election. But you are not, if we construe the statute in the broadest sense with because there has been no direction by the legislature, we have not violated the plaintiff's constitutional rights, well, correct? I'm not sure. The reason I say that is that it's really an open question whether Article 2, Section 1, Clause 3, which says that you're to take the legislature's word seriously, they're the ones who decided that there should be a limit. As you've pointed out, they decided that it should be a limit that looks at the seriousness and non-frivolity of the group and in parity with the percentage. But, but that, could I just, uh, I just want to finish one thought. If the legislature has said that, and if this court says, notwithstanding the legislature's desire to have a limit, notwithstanding Article 6, Section 1, we're going to treat this as completely open-ended and unlimited, even if there are clear cases on one side of the line. It's, not, it's quite often the case that you don't know quite where the line is, but something is clear, which is what this trial judge said. If that happened, then anyone who was forced to take part in a presidential election in which the legislature's directive about the ballot had been completely disregarded by a court that said we won't honor it could say that their rights derivatively under Article 2 were violated. But, but here, here is what uh, concerns me mm -hmm. is that we are in this case in the somewhat unusual posture of the fact that this is a limitation of ballot access imposed by the state. Mm -hmm. The state is, has said, we're going to apply this in a, the broadest way th that we can and that we're going to allow you minor parties on the ballot. Now, if the state had taken a position, no, you don't belong on the ballot because you're not a national party, then you'd have a rejoinder that would say, you don't define a national party. What makes you say we're not a national party? And in that term, it wasn't clear when the deadline passed that we couldn't apply under this provision of, of mm -hmm. the statute. But the legislature hasn't done that. What it has done is to provide, contrary to um, what has been suggested to provide an alternative. Look at it from the point of view of the candidate. But the, but the deadline's passed. That's the problem. Well, tomorrow the deadline for mailing the advance absentee ballots arrives. It's not till September 28th. But, yeah, but the, the gathering, the gathering of signatures, the alternative. Oh yes, but he, that's, that's, that's not possible. He certainly could have done it before. That is, it is simply not true, for example, that Mr. Nader was stuck and had to go this path. He could easily have said, as he has in most states, I'll be an independent, oh, I'll take petitions. But doesn't he have a right to go this way? Well, this legislature gave him this as a kind of a bonus. Look at it this way. The legislature had said previously, before 1999, that you have to have 3% signatures and you have to be affiliated with a national party whose nominee you must be. And that was very restrictive. It didn't just bifurcate it. What it did was it changed the 3% to 1%. And it told someone in the position of Mr. Nader, you can, if you want, go it alone and try to do what others have done, put in labor, not the capital of a party, put in labor and collect 
90,000 signatures. Mr. Tribe, but in this case, I mean, we, mm -hmm. he, he did not take that petition right. route. So, but in this case, he did the uh, Section A, where he says that he is, uh, that, that this is a minor party. And he's the nominee of its the, national right. convention. And the trial judge's ruling actually turns on that, saying that he was not, uh, this was not a national party. Okay, now the trial judge, in making that determination, mm -hmm used various factors to say they were not a party. They were not party building. They were not uh, doing fundraising. They didn't have a platform uh, and that they only were on the ballot in four or five states. Mm -hmm. Isn't that what the Right, and that they were said? all about just this guy. It was okay. basically a vehicle for Ralph Nader, not a, politi not a national political party. What I'd party. like you to address, and, and the problem I'm having with that mm -hmm. is, where do we draw the line here? Now, uh, several years ago, we know that the Reform Party was on the ballot. They had candidates uh -huh. in 13 states or, and uh, a number of, number of uh, states, and uh, that was fine. They were a national party. Now we get down to 2004. They're only on four states uh -huh. or five states. Uh, they only have uh, six or seven candidates. Right. Where well, you do know we the draw way the line between a third? 13 candidates mm -hmm. and seven candidates. I mean, that's uh, what, what about, we would be, we are being asked to do if we affirm what the trial judge did. Isn't that the You're asked to, to say that there is a common law element here. That is, it is very common, even in election regulation, for the legislature to use words in general circulation without defining every one of them. So what this is the legislature has said, you look at the, there's a provision saying in that event, I believe it's a provision of legislation. Certainly this court has said that the legislature expects us to do things like look at Black's Law Dictionary. All right, so now we go. When I asked you before mm -hmm. what the definition was, you started to say, well, you could define it with 12.5% and all this. Now right. if we go and say, but we have to define it, mm -hmm. does National Party then have a commonly understood definition? throughout this country? Well, not necessarily that everyone would use the same words, but everyone would say national means throughout the nation. But that's, and so therefore... The United States of America. So they have, would have to be in 50 states? Well, you see, I don't know whether it has to be 50. See, Probably it does potentially have to be 50. If a party says in principle, we are not going to look at California, we think California should float out to sea. Right. So now we are a 49-party state. I would say that is not a national party. Well, now we're saying that the legislature intended the most restrictive no. definition. No. no, no. It may have meant that the party must be nationwide, but it did not necessarily mean that the party's coffers have to be full, that it has to be unfractured, that it has to be, in other words, it, so and besides, it, the petition it, route is always available. All right, but I think that the, uh, that it, it appears that with different states having different definitions, with this state having no definition, with the FEC having another definition, with experts having other concepts, that we still are left with a situation where this term is ambiguous. It's not it, clear. It's ambiguous enough that criminal prosecution for violating something that used that term would probably violate due process. But as a prospective term, that is, if you try to get on the ballot and do not persuade a trier of fact, it's a mixed question of law and fact. So then what you're saying is, excuse me, Mr. Mr. Over here. Yes. So what you're saying then is we're going to be going through this every two to four years? I hope not. Except, well, who's going to be the trier of well, fact? Well, it seems to me that you have to remember that it's not so novel, not so unique. That is, all the way back to 1928, uh, in the case involving the rather complicated scenario, terms at least as vague, at least as ambiguous, convention, the term convention, what really is a convention, were regarded as workable terms of the law. And when the Supreme Court in American Party of Texas versus White said that it is, of course, constitutional, not even worth debating 
Well, let's move it to 2004. Let's say we had 1,000 people, 2,000 people get in a chat room on the Internet and have their convention over the Internet. Under your interpretation, that would not be a convention. That's right. Not unless, they, not unless we had gotten further into virtual reality so that, you know, the back slapping and going off in little caucuses So if we do that, how does, how does the Secretary of State apply this statute without it resulting in every four years a big party suing the, with, the, with the deeper coffers, suing the minor party, and really limiting access to the ballot I, I, and, and the development of right. other parties. Uh, it, seems, it seems to me that if the concern, and I think it's a real one, a legitimate one, uh, is not to have enormous amounts of litigation, uh, it really would take an extraordinarily gifted drafts person to figure out how to avoid that, because anything you can imagine doing by way of limiting access to the ballot, and you don't really want a ballot with a thousand names, anything you can imagine doing could, in principle, spawn litigation, even if the terms seem somewhat precise. Well, wouldn't it but, be better, though, if the legislature was doing it, then they would have, could give some it would standards, be nicer, it would be better. and they could have a pre-certification administrative mm -hmm. procedure. Going back, I just have to, because I, I promised Justice Contero I would ask a couple of questions on his behalf. And you suggest that the uh, term national party has to mean something throughout the nation. But if the terms minor party and national party, don't they have to be construed so as not to impose such burdens that only a major party can be considered one? I think that's certainly true. And there's no indication that uh, Judge Davey was even moving in the direction of a construction that would allow only minor parties in. He also did something else that's very important. He stressed that the reason he thought there was no constitutional issue here was that on every one of the separate elements, including whether they nominated him at a convention, he loses. The definition of national party could be thrown out. You could say, well, we, we don't know what that term means, but it would, in this case, lead to the result that Mr. Nader still could not be on the ballot. Where did, where did Judge Davies get this criteria that he decided to use? Um, well, he, he listened to experts. There was testimony, that, that and he said an element of common a sense. A, def a definition, of the use of experts, the well, I, proper I, way to get a definition for a term? It's not optimal. The other side didn't object, and the judge said he didn't give what he called, I think he said, excessive weight uh, to what the experts said. He looked at dictionaries. He used common sense. The main thing he said was a lot like what courts have said uh, often with respect to obscenity, what Justice Stewart used to say. You know, I have a hard time defining it out at the margins, but I know a hardcore case when I see it. And what the judge said was, that we've got one here, and he remembered something that I hope the court will remember. And that is that if Mr. Nader from the get-go had said, I'm confused about what's meant here by national party, by minor party, I'm just going to go out, as I did in other states, and get signatures. He would be on the ballot if he got enough. But it's that means that the definition of national party need not be confronted in this case, that he has never offered any justification for the conclusion that he belongs on the ballot because there are problems with one path he might have taken and well, did take, but the, the, notwithstanding the other course, perfectly clear path. Of course, the, he has been ordered to be on the ballot by the Secretary of State, and, and so he, that, that's well, where, we, during where, the, where we find right now. But in fact, you, you keep saying that, that the, the term national party or national convention would be hard to define but but the but they have been defined by legislatures i mean hawaii defined national party one way mm -hmm. one or more states if i remember correctly or two or more states it's a very Iowa very has defined relaxed definition another way mm -hmm. and so it it is in the and to have a national convention certainly a legislature could tell us what it meant by those terms. It and could, and I suppose if you imagine yourself in dialogue with them, you might say, we really are sufficiently uncertain what those terms mean 
that we do not want to use this case as a vehicle for trying to define them, especially in light of Article 2, but because there was no allegation that the entire situation confronting Mr. Nader here was problematic in any way, no allegation that he couldn't easily have taken the path that was burdensome. But doesn't but that really go to another issue, though, that back to that if mm -hmm. Mr. Nader or the Reform Party, looking at the way this statute had been applied in 2000, mm -hmm. which was, hey, Florida now went from the most restrictive to this is a slam dunk. You just have to file one of these certificates and have something. But these that five groups, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but these five groups were not just Joe and Jim and Sam, they were real, legitimate groups. Is the, the Socialist that, Party, had, they, they would well, meet they the criteria? Well, they were a national party. They collected petitions, I believe. They collected petition signatures. But I, I can't tell you for sure, because the record is well, not I think if we open. went on the website of all those other Some parties, would we, we, I don't think it. we would find and, that, they w that they would all meet this more stringent definition. Well, but it's, it's can he look and say, in 2000, <laughs> whoever wanted to get on, they made this certification, and I've been able to, you know, I can in good conscience say it because this is not a party that's not, you know, maybe on the decline, but this was a party that was actually certified to at least be a national committee in 1998. Mm -hmm. It 2000, right. I guess, is, so, so we've got a, uh, a declining and maybe almost dead party. Now they see an opportunity they can use Nader to revitalize mm -hmm. their party. Why isn't that legitimate? Well, if, if it seems to me as an aim, that is legitimate. It's also legitimate for the state to say that because it takes some work to get the petitions and because we want this alternative to be roughly as onerous, not more, at a minimum you have to have a convention that nominates you. Well, when he was nominated over the phone in that conversation on May 11th, well, let's, let's go and back. accepted the nomination. Yeah. I, I'd like to go back to this whole... Uh, national party issue mm -hmm. and would you agree that in this record there is a conflicting evidence of whether or not uh, the reform party is a national party I don't think there was any p evidence put on by the other side that well wasn't there a Miss Janice Miller who talked to pa about well, she said the there reform was party and, and I, I actually I recall a couple of witnesses right. who testified One, that this was a legitimate convention that this was a party with uh, a certain number of members et cetera, et cetera. And so well, but the judge did resolve the evidence in a way that this court under its normal rules would be deferential. But that is, shouldn't that resolving of the conflict, if you, mm -hmm. if you can agree that there was conflict in there was, this, there was a scintilla that of evidence the other way. of the conflict be in favor of access to the ballot? Well, I think he made it very clear. He said that he was putting a very heavy thumb on the scale. That's why he applied at the preliminary injunction stage a standard of beyond a reasonable doubt. And in this case, he said, the evidence is preponderant, and more than that, it's clear and convincing. So it shows that he put a thumb on the scale. I also have to be timekeeper. Yes. You're over your time, but the uh, other side, we, with, their, with our help, went three minutes over, and so we're going to give a couple of minutes. As long as I'm not getting minutes. into oh, the time of the other plaintiff, I've... Yeah, well, oh, oh, I see. You okay, see so you're divided. only, how much yes. time were you? I, I was given 24 minutes, and All they right. well, were Well, then it's up, you're into the, tw but we're going to, because they went three sure. minutes over, we will allow another few minutes if, if we don't Good, finish up. So if you want to answer the it questions It seems here. as though the longer we do this, the more we throw out the window, common sense approaches to so many things. Certainly talented lawyers, uh, and find ambiguity anywhere, right? Have, have the capacity to, to deal with the English language as such. Uh, certainly here, we're having a, a dispute over what those phrases mean. Giving everyone the benefit of the doubt that these, these do have some room for a discussion or analysis of the parameters or analysis of the concept of a national party. If it, if it, if it is so open for that discussion and it has that, that level of vagueness that's built in. What does case law tell us mm -hmm. should happen in this case? Is it well, as has been suggested? Mm -hmm. Is it as has been suggested that well then it becomes an unreasonable restriction and they, and this must go on? Or on the alternative, is it do you provide a definition? Or 
do you hold it invalid and say the statute doesn't exist? Could you help us with that? Well, the case law in general, I think, says that if it is a retrospective application, criminal prosecution, then if it is vague as applied, you, that is, if you're in the core where you have no idea whether someone is in or out of the definition, you have to reverse the conviction. Only if it is facially unconstitutional uh, do you strike the entire law down. And in prospective contexts, uh, the law is much more generous to the legislature. Uh, but one thing that the case law does seem to suggest in the, for example, the LaRouche case in uh, the District of Connecticut, I, I believe, is that even if part of one of these laws is vague, in that case, they thought that, that defining uh, access to the ballot in terms of national recognition and name recognition uh, was vague. But there was also a provision that said you could get on through the petition route. What they said was, that part is severable and valid, and we're certainly not going to say that simply because someone was kept off the ballot with one arm that was vague, that the person now can get on the ballot because they could have taken the other path. Uh, and the case law, I think, also suggests that before something is struck down as vague, it has to be, as far as I can tell, a lot more ambiguous than this. The, one of the cases they cite, uh, the definition was, you got to be a real contender. So I almost imagine Marlon Brando speaking to his brother, I could have been a contender. That's vague. But this is not like that. We will only let Marlon Brando on. It's not like that. Thank I, okay, you. Okay, thank you. With that, I think, uh, what Mr. Turner, uh, you've got, uh, uh, he's, Mr. Tribe used about three of your minutes, so but you'll have a couple or more. Thank you, Your Honors. Uh, representing the nonpartisan side of the issue and people who are interested in ballot integrity, we, I think first we have to talk about a genuineness standard. That's clearly implied. Just as a signature must be genuine, it can't be of an insane person or something like that, we have to deal with the, what is genuinely a national party. But can you, I, cannot, since you say your interest is in ballot integrity. Yes, ma'am. Uh, and, of course, that's the state interest and in why they are able to limit but in, in this situation, as applied, at least we know in this year that uh, the ballot is not unmanageable, that uh, you've got six, you know, there's not going to be anyone else qualifying. And uh, so why not accept the Secretary of State's uh, view of how she felt she had to apply this statute and say there, you know, there weren't 100 people qualify, you know, that sought to qualify. We might have a problem then. There were five or six parties, and I don't know if they all qualified through the, this route or they had to get petitions. Where, where is there, why is that interest in ballot integrity furthered by cherry-picking uh, Nader and the Reform Party off? Because the law was not followed clearly, and what we have is a sham. Well, why didn't you can't lose the facts here. Why didn't you, did you look at all the other parties that were on to see if they No, but this is an insurgent them? party. This is a typical, the experts below describe this as an insurgent party in, where you have a one little person that causes the thing to erupt and, and get, get substantial and then rapidly decline because you don't have abiding principles. But don't we have the First Amendment in the state for those issues to be clearly uh, showed that this is a hijacked party? That you see, had, that's it, that's had, what we showed. Had, but isn't that something for the voters? In other words, you're talking about voter integrity. No, uh, isn't that why we have free speech and the ability to argue about that in the, uh, uh, in the public domain? Your Honor correctly identified that the rules are there that the state has an interest. And when the state speaks, we have to follow. The, the rules are there to be followed. We have to assume there's minimal requirements here, that these standards are not without meaning. It would be meaningless to say a national party is a group of friends in New York and a group of friends in California who talk. That's meaningless. And that's their position. Let me ask you this. Uh, you uh, obviously uh, assert that you have standing to to contest what the statute uh, should, how the statute should be applied and what it means, correct? We have standing to enforce the statute just as we would okay. on a voter, just as we would to, to show signatures are not genuine. Well, yes, sir. I, I note that the that what is being asked for uh, initially is a declaratory judgment, correct? 
And injunctive relief, yes, sir. And, and, and but, but a declaratory judgment. And the declaratory judgment statute has been available since 1999 to get, come in and, and have a declaratory judgment as to what this statute means, correct? I presume it's ever right. since it's been enacted. We, somebody right. could have if there had yeah. been a controversy or a case pending. Right. Yes, sir. Well, you know, quite on, honestly, what is bothersome here is the fact that we find ourselves uh, trying to come up with a construction of this statute which and, and to strike somebody from the ballot after a deadline rather than doing it Perspectively, somebody who chose your honor, who chose intentionally, who is an independent candidate, no question in all the states he's appearing, but who, as his campaign manager said in the testimony, he simply where this route is, where he's, uh, where it is easier to appear on the line as a party as opposed to collecting signatures. This is the way he went. But That's you, why we have a controversy. Well, you have standing to attack it, but it's still the state's compelling interests that are at stake. And so yes. again, you said your interest is in ensuring ballot integrity. As evidence through the statute passed by the legislature. That's what we're here but to But how could we have a system that would require that for each time that there is a question as to whether a, a national convention was held, that there would be a trial court's fact-finding of whether there were enough balloons or, uh, you know, enough of these, uh, uh, you know, hats. I mean, whatever we watch that seems to be what, what we come to think of as a national convention. What, a, what, Where is the interest of the state in how the convention gets uh, I think there's uh, an interest. Done. I think there's an interest in that there be a genuine national party. But this was, again, now we're talking about the fact this was, you would agree, in 1998, this was a genuine national yes. party. And this right. is typical of insurgent parties. But so now we're going to get into government 101 and decide when on a continuum from when they were at their heyday till when they die out that we're going to knock them off the ballot. Well, we would certainly, Your Honor, would agree that in 1995, at the beginning of this party, it was not a national party. I mean, party, there is a, a, con, there is a problem here because at the beginning and at the end, they're not functioning. But doesn't, well, isn't it, again, back so, uh, go ahead. Just but sir. isn't it yes, true sir. as a natural course, if you read the history of all these insurgent parties, as you call them, that they die a slow and natural death mm, no, without they, the courts intervening and whatever? Well, the Bull Moose Party was one that was described. George Wallace's party was one that describes. Usually the decline is very rapid, and there's disintegration and fractionalization, just as occurred here. And, and in that's weighing the harms and the benefit, what's the harm if this court were not to intervene and, and allow the ballot to go forward as the secretary is certified? As I see it, you have a situation where one of these parties can be captured exactly as it is here, and by country club is the one of the witnesses described and really take somebody and use this vehicle to evade the one percent signature requirement of minor parties which is not fair well are you, that's what we're talking about are here, we then to take into consideration the fact that this is ralph nader and that he is uh, running on an in, as an independent in all the other states and that he is not going to be running as a reform party candidate. Is that supposed to be something that we take in our calculus of deciding this issue? Well, it's the party under section 103091 parenthesis 2. It's the party and not the individual candidate that's entitled under the law to place the candidate on the ballot. But my concern in that's that, I mean, I'm concerned with the subtext here. What's going to, you know, the newspaper story is going to be very different from what the, what the legal story is. And what I'm concerned about is, although we know we have a legal question to evaluate that if we get ourselves too far into the uh, the politics isn't the court then running afoul of the uh, and I, I'm never good at this word of the justiciability issue uh, as far as getting into a quintessential political controversy J judge your honor the statutes there the statute has meaning, it's a ballot access limitation, and it must be applied in a meaningful way. And I think the, the evidence in this case is clear by experts on both sides. Well, are you then suggesting, let me go back to this, the question you have a chance to answer. Yes, what is, if we were writing this opinion, we're not just dealing with this competent substantial evidence to support a finding, what is the definition that the court says when the legislature did not define this term, 
we go to, and what do we then do with the term national party? We define it to mean what? To have a genuine national party, the expert for both our clients and the expert for the reform party testified you have to have four criteria. Oh, wait, wait, so are you suggesting that this court take a statute that was passed in 1999 without any legislative history, that with a term that was on the book since 1970, and apply criteria that took place in a trial after September 1st of 2004? I'm suggesting that we do what we do every day in interpreting statutes. We apply what is re what is meaningful, what, what people know in common sense, and what everyone agrees on. There are four essential criteria. It can't be very common criteria. sense if you needed an expert. You see, that's the whole problem with this, is that if this is just like the question of, uh, you know, the 2000 election, I mean, I'm sure none of us really gave much thought to what minor political parties meant and what this, these terms meant. I, you're telling me that we all know what a national party meant by these four criteria? I'm saying that people who know what, I'm not a party person, I'm not a party expert, but people who understand what parties are, and clearly it must be national in scope of some kind, but the, but the expert has clearly laid out four minimum criteria that everyone in the area recognizes. No, but we don't rely upon experts for giving, for the court to give a legal definition. Well, I, we, I respectfully we, disagree, Judge Wells. Done all the time. Isn't that the role of the court? To, to uh, it, it's done that? all the time in litigation. We amplify statutes and explain what does it mean. And it, this is done all the time. But, that we're not asking you to do. Your honors, to be perfectly honest, you're just sensitive about this, and I understand that. But the fact is, the legislature prescribed this standard, and it must have meaning. So why wouldn't the Hawaii, the Iowa, the Puerto Rico, or the Guam definition of political, national political party or convention control over historical? experts well, presented if, before if, one trial judge. Let's ask it the reverse. If Florida wanted to adopt that standard, why didn't they adopt the standard? Well, what I'm saying they did. I don't want to get argumentative, yes, but sir, what I mean, you're saying is it's common sense, it's reasonable. Everybody understands it. To accept that argument, Iowa, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and Guam don't get it. No, sir. They don't understand I think it. that if you want In to... the reality of it is, is there's a spectrum from broad to more narrow and what you are asking for from your expert on that spectrum leans towards the more narrow definition. I think if you want to adopt a definition that is not normally followed, if you want to adopt something that is different from what is normally in the, in the by political scientists, by everyone concerned with this, recognized, then you should do so. The state is certainly free to do so. Here, it certainly is not reasonable that they would adopt such a broad standard in light of the 1% requirement so that a minor party candidate if it's nationally affiliated, doesn't have to follow the 1%, it must mean something. What Then what? Aren't they have to be a genuine national party, something that is viable and real, and not this moribund, decadent, non-existent, and captured simply for purposes of injecting itself into political realms when they're not, the legislature has not said that. There has to be a genuineness here. There has to be a viability. And the trial court found it wasn't there. And, and I think you're bound by that finding, and I think it's a fair finding. The trial court said it's not a close question. The ebb has flowed out for this party. This is not a viable, real national party. This is well. And, it's, and it has two or three states that it's running candidates in, most of whom relate to Mr. Sean O'Hara, who's a fringe uh, issue, a fringe candidate or person. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. I know I'm over. So. Well, we are over, but you're you're only uh, you're over by five minutes, so you're 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 fine. If okay. you want to. Thank you then, food. Judge Wells. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. Did no, you? I'm, 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 may I just add one quick point? It, it, does anyone? I I'm think it's right. just one quick. It's very important point. to recognize that in this case, the constitution of the National Reform Party itself defines convention makes it very clear that they were going off the convention route when they went on the phone to nominate him. He accepted that nomination. Then he said, oops, maybe I should have a meeting. And so there was a meeting in Dallas. If you focus on the facts of this case, I think you can say that we hope the legislature will clarify whether it means to go the Iowa route or the Hawaii route. We don't have to reach that here because by the party's own definition, he was not nominated at a convention of a national party. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Okay. Uh, we'll give you uh, three minutes for rebuttal, which is very generous. I want you to yes, ma'am. My name is Andrew Byrne, and I represent the Reform Parties. 
and I'd like to address Justice Anstead's question about the intent of the legislature. The legislature must have been considering that it wanted to be more expansive than it had been. After all, it could have left in place a 3% or a 1% uh, petition requirement. And so in giving this alternative method, it must have been considering that we want the participation of minor political parties, and we're going to give them every benefit and every effort. When they first did it. that, when they first actually added that requirement to the statute, it really wasn't to be more inclusive. It really, they added it to the percentage requirement, didn't they? Well, and, and it was only after the passage of the constitutional amendment that says you can't make the requirements for minor parties more onerous than the party that has the most votes in the state, uh, that we actually severed that. So can we really say that when this was passed, it was really to give uh, clearer access? Well, the whole movement to amend the Constitution and to change the election law was to give access to minor parties. And that was done by dividing it and, and instead of having uh, uh, two requirements, you, you divided it into separate requirements. They certainly did. And well, the overall, you know, the, what, what I am, am, am asking you, and I appreciate very much you coming back and, and addressing this very core issue, you know, as far as the intent of the legislature. But I'd like you to address it from the broader standpoint of this being a restriction. That is, that uh, clearly. The legislature has imposed some standards. One of the standards, whether we call it an alternative or just a different uh, way of doing it, is, of course, going the petition route. All right. But the, the purpose behind having standards or restrictions is to assure some legitimacy here. That is, that it's not frivolous or whatever. And that's really where I would like you to address how we come out on this of whether or not we have faithfully okay, obeyed the legislature in terms of that being their purpose. We can see it uh, clearly when it's a petition situation because they've just set out whether it's 1% or 3% or, or whatever. But now what they've said is that also as an alternative way to have this legitimacy and non-frivolousness, if you are the legitimate nominee of a national party that has a national convention and so on, then we're going to let that substitute, really, then, and say, well, that, that also demonstrates that you're not frivolous, all right? So here is where I am concerned with the arguments that this may be a sham. That is, that this is just a way to get on the ballot of somebody that has no interest whatsoever in this national party and its platform or whatever it stands for. And so would you help me uh, get over that hump if the legislature clearly had this purpose of having some legitimacy by carrying the banner of a national party, does that really exist under the facts of this case? Your Honor, it does, because if the legislature in intended a restriction, and I'm certain that they did, that restriction before we had the line drawing by the lower court was good enough to eliminate most of the uh, we don't have a phone book list of candidates. Six out of 22 minor parties on the ballot. So the restriction before this case was good enough to achieve the limits that I'm hearing that everyone is concerned about. And before you sit down, would you give us your best case scenario from the proof that was submitted? Uh, because we've had sort of this idea of the, the uh, you know drawing on a spectrum here or whatever of whether or not this might be a party dying on the vine but that it's still on the vine, you know, that it hasn't died yet. What was the most substantial proof offered below to show that there was still life in this party, uh, such as when uh, it was on the ballot in 2000, for instance, I believe? What was, what was the strongest proof to show that the party was still a viable party? The fact that it is the fourth largest minor party in America today, and wherever this court draws the line, if it draws the line where the lower court did, it will effectively exclude every minor party. Because if you are the fourth largest party in America and you can't make it on a well, ballot... What, makes it the four, what was the evidence that as of 2004 that it's the fourth largest party? Well, how do you define... I, I in in that. terms of voter registration, if you take the number of people in America that have signed up to be part of this party, 
We are the fourth largest in America. Was there any testimony as to what the platform is of the uh, Reform Party? Th there was testimony uh, from Ms. Amato, who represents Mr. Nader, that she, have che she got a copy of our platform and that she looked at it to make sure that it was consistent with Mr. Nader's views before he agreed to join this party. It was adopted at the 2004 convention and placed on the website. So, so it's on the, if anyone can go to the website and see the platform? Well, yes, ma'am. I don't know if that's exactly in the record that way, but there's no question that Ms. Amato was able to get it off the website. She testified to that to make sure that Mr. Nader and the party were consistent with their beliefs. But the fact that Mr. Nader is running as an independent in all the other states, is that, does that affect the calculus in this case? I, I don't see how it does, Your Honor, because what Mr. Nader well, chooses... Well, again, it's the interest of the Reform Party to be on the ballot, but by nominating Mr. Nader, they're only getting on the ballot for the president, vice president in Florida. I believe there are other states where the Reform Party is, is either on the ballot or attempting to, and of course it's being challenged. Well, logically, if he's going to carry the banner in Florida of the Reform Party, wouldn't uh, he be carrying the banner of the Reform Party in all the other states? Well... He's carrying the banner of the Reform Party any place that we can get him on the ballot. We would certainly, our party wants him on every state's ballot for the Reform Party, and we're excited that this is an opportunity for the Reform Party to rise back up where it was. Uh, after all, this party grew out of Ross Perot and uh, other national candidates. And Pat, Pat Buchanan. And you Pat think Buchanan. it was a straight face, someone thinks the Reform Party could go from 2000, Pat Buchanan, to Nader and... 2004? Well, the beauty of any political party is that any group of people that's part of that party can make their ideas heard. Um, I, I, uh, I suspect that, that there are candidates that are members of the national party that not all of the members of that party would endorse their views. But after all, that's the essence of democracy in our party and the rest of the parties. So the fourth, again, so the, by, the fourth largest party by registration is, is what was testified to in the record. Yes, ma'am. And is that's there the any 2004 impact? registration? I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. 2004 registration. Is there any, any impact that uh, Ms. Amato also testified she looked at those and said they were not inconsistent with the views of, of Mr. Nader on, on several things? I think that's the way the testimony was presented. But she also testified he's not a member of this party. No, he, he apparently is not. And uh, that he, he apparently, uh, is, is, is that of any, any moment, or is that just a, a, uh, a nothingness that we should just uh, not consider? I, I, I don't know any law in Florida that requires a candidate to be a member of a party in order to be that, that party's candidate. And so then, the, then we could have uh, a party, national party in Florida, with an individual slate that in some other state uh, they would be running against the nominees of that national party, is what you're saying. Is that, is that what that would lead to? I, I don't think it would lead to that at all. I think that uh, if, if we have a candidate that is carrying our banner, then I wouldn't suspect that he'd be running against our banner anywhere else. Well, it would, would have to be if, if you had a Reform Party candidate in another state, different slate of candidates than here, then they would certainly, if they're running for the same office, for the same party, uh, be running against one another from a national standpoint, would they not? I don't think that would happen in a presidential election when the Reform Party nominates one candidate for president. Okay. In other words, you've not, he's, wherever you're going to get on the ballot, it has to, you have to have Nader as your candidate. Absolutely. Mr. Nader is the Reform Party candidate. Okay. Thank I, you I, very I, much. My... And I think that we're, was, was there... Okay, if there's, this is from the Secretary of State. It's actually, I did have one question to you anyway. Um, I, I will be very brief, but a but couple of things. Um, John McCain, as vice president, as potential vice president of the Democratic Party, is a perfect example of why there does not have to be that. As a matter of constitutionally, there does not have to be that sort of limitation. Also, the court cannot constitutionally inquire into whether a party complies with its own constitution or its own rules. That's why this nomination, the, the foundation of the nomination thing, cannot work because you intrude on the inner workings of the party, you violate association. I just wanted to ask Can you not look, though, to determine if you have a national party that has a national structure, <coughs> to determine whether, whether that has been followed or is it just some fringe operation that's doing whatever they want? 
If it does not follow the structure, if it does not follow the plan, it does not follow the Constitution, can one not look at that to determine whether whatever the entity is, uh, it is not what it purports to be? Not only if it is narrowly tailored to affect a legitimate state interest. And the question is, is the lack of strict compliance with the Constitution probative of um, a sham? And if you narrowly construe yeah. that, perhaps. But here, what, what Judge Davey found and what the evidence was is by virtue of non-compliance with the Constitution, that alone is enough to say you can't get on because you were not properly nominated. But wouldn't nominated. that not be probative? Nominated. I'm sorry. That's that, unconstitutional. Would that not be probative, however, of whether it is truly the national, the national organization which it purports to be? Well, it would be again, only depending on the definition, Your Honor. And the problem there, of course, is if you have a definition that says you have to abide by, by the rules, what does, that, what does that mean? And the other thing I, I need to say is there's been a lot of talk about uh, um, you can always run as an independent. Don't forget, Your Honors, and the Secretary of State cannot implement a statute that says you can only be an independent. Because to be an independent, you give up your associational rights. All right, thank you. The, what I, the question I had was are we, the September 18th deadline, which is the, for the mailing tomorrow, do the, do the supervisors of elections, do they mail today or they actually physically can mail tomorrow? I believe they can mail tomorrow. We and is there any, with the storm that occurred in Pensacola, is there any, just from the court's point right. of view, since we're in obviously our own right. little emergency, is there any indication that that deadline is going to be extended by the Secretary of State? We, do, we have no indication of that. With regard to that remedy, Your Honor, I have, to, I have to advise you of one thing to consider. If the remedy is to, to affirm the judgment one way or the other, the, the court has to consider whether that remedy, whether that decision would have to be pre-cleared under Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act and have to be submitted to the Department of Justice. Is As that a, something raised in your brief? It, uh, it is not raised in my right, brief. Well, we're going to have that one. I understand. <laughs> well, that will be uh, next year. <laughs> Thank you very much for everybody's uh, responses to our questions. The court is in recess. Please rise. Mr. Nader took his case to court in Florida and six other states. His name currently appears on the ballot in 34 states, six of which may still remove his name. You may watch this program, as well as others related to courts and the law, on our website, cspan.org. Click on America and the Courts. Join us each week for programming on the federal judiciary. America and the Courts airs Saturday evenings at 7 Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. Tonight on American Perspectives, the past, present, and future of television news, a discussion with Walter Cronkite.